Thank you for joining the Cooney Conservation Program's Winter Webinar Series. This year, KCP's Winter Webinar Series focuses on the theme of conservation in the context of climate change, restoration in action. We are co-hosting this webinar with the Columbia Basin Watershed Network. I'm KCP Stewardship Coordinator, Adrian Shaw. And with me, I have Kristen Asen, CBWN Senior Manager. We also have Nicole Trigg, the KCP Communications Coordinator, ensuring that the webinar runs smoothly in the background. Kootenai Conservation Program is a broad partnership of land and water conservation and stewardship groups, government agencies, resource industries, and agricultural producers working throughout the East and West Kootenays. KCP has four main priorities, increase the effectiveness, collaboration, and coordination of private land securement, increase effectiveness and coordination of stewardship activities taking place on private land, to build financial and technical capacity of our partner organizations, and to serve as a network to achieve these efficiencies. This mandate of KCP is to coordinate and facilitate these conservation efforts on private land and generate the support and resources needed to maintain this effort. I'd like to now introduce uh, CBWN. Kristen, if you would like to come on. Thanks, Adrian. I'm Kristen Asen, the Senior Manager with the Columbia Basin Watershed Network. As a network, we support our members, water stewardship groups across the Columbia Basin to achieve their watershed goals. We do this by supporting peer-to-peer -peer learning and are the go-to hub for our groups to find training, information, resources, and connections. Right now, we are receiving applications for our summer mapping program. We work with Selkirk College to connect GIS students with water stewardship groups looking to engage their communities with mapping products. If you check out our website, you can read about past projects, including mapping of the Columbia wetlands and other watershed and riparian areas. The 2019 intake will be open till March 29th, and you can stay tuned to this and other activities, including our current uh, member needs assessment survey through our, our monthly newsletter. So the, as a host, we would all like to acknowledge that we are gathering on the traditional territories of the Sinaiq's First Nation, the Tunaha Nation, and the Okanagan Nation Alliance. Um, today, before we get started, we'd actually like to hear a little bit from you first. Uh, we will have a couple of short polls. The first one is asking, where are you based? So if you just take a moment to let us know um, where you're located. Are you in East, West Kootenays, North Columbia, elsewhere in BC, or even beyond BC? And uh, if you'd like to give us a little more detail, if you're joining us from outside BC or even beyond Canadian borders, if you want to just let us know in the chat box where you're uh, logging in today. So we'll give folks just a little bit of time to get settled and let us know where, where you're based. Okanagan, Calgary, wow, great. So far we've got 49 participants joining us today. Looks like 14% from the East Kootenai, 31 from the West Kootenai, 47% uh, elsewhere in BC and uh, eight beyond BC. So thanks, thanks for letting us know. We'll just move on now to what's your affiliation. So if you could let us know whether you're government, student, nonprofit, consultant, First Nations or other. And again, if you want to give us a little more detail about what the, the other might mean, be great. We'll just let folks get settled in, grab a coffee or tea before we get going today. And please note that if you do want to share this uh, webinar with friends or, or colleagues, it is going to be recorded and will be shared with you um, after, after the webinar. So thanks. So we've got 33% uh, are joining us from nonprofits, another 33% consultants, 21% from government, and 12% other. Uh, thanks very much. So we just wanted to say thank you to all of these amazing speakers we've had. This is the third of uh, four webinars that are hosted by KCP, and the second one in collaboration with the Columbia Basin Watershed Network. The, the fourth in the series of the KCP's Winter Webinar Series will be held on March 7th. If you want to join Mark Trudeau from the Rocky Mountain Trench Natural Resources Society, he'll be talking about ecosystem 
restoration in the Rocky Mountain Trench. So thanks, I'll turn it back over to Adrian who can, will thank the folks who made this possible today. Great, thanks Kristen. So I'd just like to extend a thanks out to our program sponsors and supporters and without their support we wouldn't be able to put on events like this. And I'll just take you through a bit of webinar information. Um, the webinar is approximately 45 minutes long with 15 minutes at the end for questions. As an audience member, you are on mute and will be on mute for the duration of the presentation so that we don't have distracting background noises or feedback. If you're not fam familiar with Zoom platform, take a moment to locate your control panel by hovering your mouse over the bottom of the screen. You can adjust your video layout between active speaker view or gallery view, the presentation. Enter any questions you have in the Q&A box and they'll be answered at the end of the presentation. If you're having any technical issues, please put your questions, comments in the chat box. KCP Communications Coordinator Nicole Trigg will be monitoring the chat and will do her best to help you out. The webinar will be recorded and made available on our website, like Kristen had said. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce Gregoire. Um, Gregoire, in 1991, he created the Kootenai Permaculture Institute to follow his passion for permaculture, regenerative agriculture, and ecological restoration. He has been teaching permaculture and consulting across Canada for over 25 years. Gregoire has also been working in repairing restoration for over 20 years and more recently in wetland restoration. He is a co-founder of the Slocan Stream Keeper Society, which started in 2003 with the goal of improving public knowledge on aquatic ecosystems, to improve stewardship of aquatic and riparian ecosystems, and to identify and restore ecologically sound and effective restoration projects. We're really happy to have Gregoire with us today. Gregoire, I'm going to pass it over to you if you'd like to now load your presentation. Thank you, Adrian. Thank you, Kristen. Yeah, I'd like to thank uh, Kootenai Conservation Program for hosting this uh, webinar. Also, with uh, thanking uh, Columbia Basin Watershed Network for hosting. So, I really appreciate being able to be here today and sharing with everybody the journey we've had with the uh, Spokane River Stringkeepers here in the Spokane Valley of British Columbia. If you're not familiar with the Stokan Valley, we're situated in the BC interior, in the uh, interior rainforest here, and uh, we're between the Okanagan and the Rockies, uh, north of the border. So here are my tree passion, as she already mentioned. I like to plant trees in my own backyard. Many people call that farming. I run, I'm running out of space, so I like to plant trees in my neighbor's backyard, and I like to call that restoration. And also like to plant trees all over Canada. So I've been teaching across Canada for many years. So I've been involved with the Slocan River String Keepers since day one. So we am a co-founder. So the String Keepers also, uh, Slocan River String Keepers are involved with monitoring and research. Uh, we also do a lot of public outreach and uh, education in the local schools here. And my main interest and my main project are around the restoration, both riparian and wetland restorations. I've been quite busy with that restoration work along the Silicon River. So here's one of the projects uh, we started one, the early one in 2005 along the river, sort of North Winloff, where people live around here. Uh, this one's been doing very well. So we uh, find a lot of native trees there and they're doing well. So just the, uh, to show the, the early beginning, we were quite ex <clears throat> excited to be able to sort of have this kind of a triangle between uh, the, the funders, basically the uh, nonprofit society, which is part of the Spokane River Stream Keepers and the landowners. We thought that there was a need for restoration, <clears throat> but often landowners didn't have the knowledge, know-how, or knew how to proceed. So we were fortunate to make this partnership between funders, ourselves, and landowners. And obviously the landowners could go directly to funders to fund their own project, but in the, you know, in the last 15 years we've been involved, most have gone to uh, work with us, so it's been very good. And often the, the third party is the, uh, or the fourth party would be the government agency. Some projects do require some uh, permitting and all of that. So uh, again, another photo of a mature project about 15 years ago, that one or 14 years now. So lots of willow and uh, cottonwood and uh, 
a few other species, alders and red rooted dogwood. So the process briefly, I'll go over that briefly. I have lots of uh, slides and photos to show. So we're meeting with landowners. So we've been going through two uh, different pro process. So either from a top down process and a bottom up. So the top down has been through our study of the valley, through air photos and mapping and all of that. So we sort of decide and then our knowledge of water of the river uh, being paddled. And then we had a fish biologist had, who has swim the river for many, many years. So we somewhat focus on some targets places you know about property so we so often approach the landowner that way we wanted to work with them and the other way from bottom up some people approaching us uh, phoning us or talking to us to uh, uh, want our uh, our help and our support for a project so the next step be well the first after that there's meeting with them and then sort of walking the land walking the site to so that sets the site and then from there developing a prescription or restoration plan and then looking at the funders for potential funders for depending on the project, it's the riparian. And are more recently, we've been more involved with wetland restoration. So who's funding what and all of that. And obviously there's the whole writing and submitting the proposal. And uh, we've been sort of also developing a landowner agreement for some of the projects because we're looking at all these projects have a long-term goal. And then with our experience, it's been, it's been, a, it's been mostly beneficial that most uh, people have been uh, pretty good with us and with the project, respecting and, uh, you know, and supporting that. But we also had a few people who uh, sold the land after a few years, so for different reasons. So sometimes when uh, this is an, on the, the proposal I submitted, there's some potential, some per project may require permitting. So we look into a different government agency to see what, if we do require a permit, and then we submit a permit. If the funding after that is approved, then it's uh, go time, so we go again. And all throughout all of these steps, we're always in the, Post conversation with the landowners. So I found with all the year working with a diversity of landowners, it's very important to keep that conversation going so that they're well informed. And if you have to come and visit and look at the site, I always like to let them know phone call, email, whatever works. <clears throat> and the same when the project is approved and we move on to the ground to implement the project. So they need to know what, what's going on, what we're going to do, who's coming, all of that stuff. And then I'll go in more detail in a minute with the project implementation. And then after that, the, the fun part of the project report. And we always need to keep in mind maintenance and monitoring of these projects. So that's also important to see what, what's working, how can we improve, how can we get better. So you know. uh, another photo of uh, some property uh, uh, property along the Sokan River again. Uh, we found that often when there's the property is highly degraded, this property I've known for many, many years, for 25 years, I've lived here so near my neighborhood. So there was a whole row of, uh, of birch tree, tall birch tree. They all started to kind of uh, fall down into the river. So this landowners was losing a lot of uh, uh, land, basically, uh, you know, meters or feet every few years. So, and then the, the birch all started to fall down. As you see on the left there, fall into the river or just kind of lean down very, low so um, he had been trying himself you see he's left the buffer zone while you see you have the bracken fern drying up so he's kept the buffer zone not cutting the hay he was it, it feels mostly a hay crop there but and then he did plant trees on his own but he was having a hard time and then the beavers were eating the trees and all of that so he's kind of also getting older so when he saw us uh, showing up with a group of stream keepers and with shovels and hands and trees he was very excited and very happy so he's been he's been one of our main supporters so what I like to say, it's, it's nice when we're able to show up before the last tree or what I like to call the last row of trees along the bank. Once those trees are gone, it's much harder to re, re, uh, restore or bring back the, uh, a, tree, a tree and shrub uh, ecosystem on the, on the riparian zone. So I'll talk more about that. So here, implementation. So again, if permits and approval, um, we go to that stage as well first, you know, to make sure we have all the permits, all the approval with, <clears throat> you know, and a good conversation with the landowner so we're on the same page. And then it's a matter to getting all the people and the key people in place, either staff or volunteer with spring keepers, uh, if, you know, so supervisors required or contractors for larger projects. So everybody is informed and, you know, um, coordinated. Uh, safety first, always very important so that nobody gets hurt, nobody. Uh, yeah, um, so the timing is the next step, very important, uh, especially for a project where the river floods. So we most, our most active period is spring and fall. And we also have done some fish habitat restoration where we have put logs in the river, then we have to go with the 
the fish window, when is the good time. Often late fall has been a good time for us to work so that there's no fish spawning or you know, no damage to any fish or anything like that. Uh, other things important, what tools are required, will be required have enough of, of the appropriate tools, equipment, machine is, is for larger projects. Have all the material in place, the plants and the added protectors, and I'll get into that because it's great to plant our trees and shrub, but we've had some interesting learning experience with that. Uh, so the next step obviously is shovel in the ground, so we implement the project, we plant. And what I found very important and uh, is to document these projects. In the early days, we didn't do enough. We still have photos, and sometimes now we're able to do videos as well. And writing it down, I always feel, or sometimes I feel it's not working if I'm just walking around counting the trees or just writing it down. But it's part of the whole project, so to document and be able to share with other people after that and your articles or you know, or, and, um, and the other one I want to mention also is school. So while we have inviting community, that could also uh, integrate school. Sometimes the school students come into, into the planning process, or sometimes we just have an open house kind of a day or field trip where people are coming to, you know, celebrate the project and, and see what we're up to, what we've done. So uh, it's very important that communication with the local community. So this is the project where this sort of similar part of the land where we're working and then this was more, there were already many larger trees or medium sized trees I should say, birch and a few uh, shrub hawthorn and all that. So that was a lot easier to restore so we were able to put the native uh, species, again your cottonwood, your willows, but we we're also able to put some evergreen here, spruce at the bottom and there was a few cedars that did very well. So this project was very successful and you see the fencing all around so I'll get into that in a minute. Uh, challenges I'll talk throughout, but briefly, there's I've divided into two, uh, two aspects of the challenges the social aspect and the environmental aspect. And often, the social is as important or challenging as the environmental challenges. Uh, by social, what I mean the communication, the interaction with the landowners and other people involved with the project, and sometimes also with the community. So the community is informed what we're up to, why we're doing it. Uh, the goals are very important. Um, we found that the Owners, between the funders, the owners, and ourselves, we had somewhat different goals. Uh, one of our largest funders at the beginning was the uh, Columbia Power Corporation. They, their interest was to create fish habitat to bring back the rainbow trout in the Sultan River. So their focus was fish habitat. So while we were planting trees and re restoring the riparian, we find it very important to have a healthy riparian to be able to have a healthy uh, river ecosystem and healthy fish. Uh, it was sort of a longer term, so we had to make a point of that was going to be beneficial for everybody. Landowners often uh, get in touch with us when they're losing their land, they're losing soil, they're losing the, their their banks are eroding. So for them, it's a it's a matter of, uh, of uh, protecting their banks, so their river banks. So by coming out and planting trees, it's a great again on the long term, but sometimes in the short term, it's not enough. So we've had other strategies we've used for that. So just to be very clear, what are the goals? how much land we need to set aside, what is the buffer zone, what, what, how much area we need on the riparian to achieve those goals. Uh, <clears throat> I wrote as other challenges, the financial and finance and the economics or time, you know, those are the big one as well. Uh, we often, we have a lot more potential for project and we have money to work with at this point. Uh, and also, you know, and we, we, we're also always looking at funding and new fundings, but, I'd also like to address the, the whole larger picture of the economic system as not always, I mean, we're doing better in British Columbia, but at the same time, we're not valuing restoration as an important, important economic uh, goal or function that we you know, these projects, uh, you know, having a healthy environment will benefit. There's so many benefits that, that, you know, any dollars invested, any money invested is, will have a very, important return in not only in the long run, in the medium run, but in the short term as well. So, and then time, as everybody knows, there's never enough time, but uh, it's also about timing. So having it the right time. And ob obviously in this part of the world, we have the winter, which is the low season where we're not very active on the ground, but there's a lot of prep preparation work and getting in touch with everybody and writing before the proposals. So those are the, some of the big challenges. Briefly environmental, uh, I, I wrote down erosion, flood and drought predators and the grasses, so I'll go into some photos with those ones. So flood, the river fluctuate three to four meter high and uh, difference, you know, from the low water and more or less the standard year in late winter uh, to uh, around June, between May 15th to June 1st is our high water here in the Spokane, so that's uh, probably not 
to be far from my place. Again, that flood, so you hard to see, but there are trees under the water right now in that photo. So we've had a lot of challenges with you know planting trees and having everything underwater for you know sometimes a few days, but sometimes a, a few weeks, sometimes a month or so. So uh, our strategy is to try to as much as possible plant higher. But often the water, the place that floods are the place that are eroding. So we we have to find a, a common um, place for that. So the other strategy is planting taller trees. It's a project we've been working on for the last three years on the banks. So that, again, that's part of that property or part of that riparian uh, zone flood also. And then some of it floods so much that the you know we're putting tree protectors here for beavers and other critters. And then. You can imagine sometimes the water is up at the top of it, those protectors, so three feet high, those protectors are about three feet high or a meter high. So these are cottonwoods and willows that we bring into the site. They're already two, two and a half meter tall, uh, six, eight feet high. And so they have a better chance to survive and, uh, under flood. In the early days, we were planting just small little, little guys, you know, little uh, trees about a, you know, a meter or whatever or two. A foot, I should say, a foot or two high, and then uh, 30 centimeters, so they didn't have much of a chance if they were underwater for too long. So taller trees have worked for us. And regarding drought, what we do is we plant them deeper, because with these trees, the cottonwoods and the willow, they, if you plant them deeper, they will grow roots and, and, and survive. And, and as you plant them deeper, there's more moisture down lower. Uh, you can do that with an evergreen or m most trees. You can't plant them any deeper; they'll they'll die. They won't make it. But, Willow cottonwood, you're allowed to do a lot of things. I think they're very resilient. Grasses, so we're getting to our challenges. The grasses, if you can see, carefully, if you look into the middle of the photo there, there's a little small little red cedar there, western red cedar. So that's kind of struggling with all that tall, thick grass. So that's the canary grass that's pretty predominant along the river bank of the Spokane River. So we've got different strategies, you know, cutting grass, mulching, you know, protectors, and all of that. So uh, and that's what I meant earlier on when I said if there are still trees on the banks, it's nice to get there before all the trees are gone. Because all the, when once all the trees are gone on the river bank, the grass takes over the canary grass, and then you have grass that grows six, eight feet tall, two, two and a half meter tall, and it's quite challenging to establish a tree and shrub layer there. Uh, mulch has worked for us. We don't like we don't for landscape fabric too much, but we work with the wood chips mulch. Uh, wood chip has served many functions. It does uh, smother the grass for a while, uh, also provide nutrients to the soil and eventually to the trees. Um, yeah, and hold some moisture as well. So it's uh, it's a good strategy. Sometimes it's the challenge to get access to enough wood chip and be able to deliver it to the site efficiently. Uh, rodents are a big, big, uh, big challenge for sure for us. The small little guy, the voles, if you look at the bottom of that tree, that's a cedar, western red cedar again, and it's all been girdled. So all the, the bark is gone, so that tree would most likely die if it's left on its own. But if you're observing a bit uh, carefully, you'll see some nice little uh, white roots just, just above the girdling, uh, the girdling part of the tree. Uh, so that cedar that's sort of blooming away are able to grow some roots on top of it. And if there's enough soil or if that tree was buried or, you know, these new roots will go into the ground and, um, and grow. Um, the reason I think those roots grew actually was because it was thick grass. Sometimes what the enemy is also an ally. So it's, uh, it's that tree managed to survive if we remulched it or we may, might have planted it deeper. But uh, so, uh, and often the, the, the big rodents are out there too, the beavers. Uh, this is a beavers eating the larger trees, cottonwoods and the, and the, medium-sized trees, I would say. Um, there's no, to my experience, there's no, obviously no size of trees and no species or hardly any species that I've seen on the river, on the bank, on the, on the river banks that are immune to beavers. They have their preference. They prefer the cottonwood and the willows, which is a, our joke. So we like to plant a lot of food for the beavers. So we plant a lot of willows and cottonwood, our two favorite species on the river bank, but that's their favorite as well. So. Uh, uh, and it's okay, beavers are part of the whole ecosystem, and I always like, very excited to read all about this beaver restoration work, but for us, it's a bit more of a challenge than allies, because until you have a healthy functioning system, they, you know, on, on the bank and the riparian system, they will, uh, you know, cut down trees, and, and some of these trees, if they're big enough in this photo, they may shoot back, may come back if they're deciduous. But when we just plant little trees that are one or two year old and they mow them all down, sometimes they don't come back, you know. So 
the pattern I've observed on the on the river here is that every beaver will come into one area and I like to suggest they clear cut this area very intensively and then move on to another patch. So if they have enough riparian to move on, to have a cycle of whatever five to ten years, we're good. But if they come back the, the, the following year when the tree's starting to, starting to go back, then it may not work. So we've had to kind of protect for the short term so we get uh, riparian established. Uh, we've tried different strategies. Uh, we've heard and sort of uh, learned about a technique using paint, latex paint mixed in with sand. So we did that for a few years and some of them, many of our trees. So these trees were all trees with, with paint and sand. And that worked for one year, for one season. And there's a few people, a few friends and allies that claim that works very good for them. But for us, it only worked for a season or two. And after that, beaver came out and they mowed down 45 or 50 of those trees that you're looking at right now. So. It was quite disappointing to, <laughs> to learn that, but it was good to learn. So now we, I don't trust it. I, I'm so surprised. I don't know why it worked for a year or two, but then one day I figured it was the, the, the winter. We had a big winter, two, two winter and last winter ago. Uh, I figured beaver needed to harvest a lot of wood, a lot of food for their winter. So they came and mowed down some uh, two or three projects like that were mowed down to the ground. So very challenging. So. Strategies we use now are most of the time are either the uh, these uh, stucco wire fence is a four feet tall fence with a steel post that works 100%. The beaver if it's tight and you know and well anchored it will keep up the beaver. Uh, the challenge is if the, we have a site that go on the water that floods then we don't like to use that we don't like to see the fence on the water and all of that so we have to use ground like this ground is higher that doesn't flood. And then you have these little cones these little uh, plastic tree protectors and. Uh, they work also for beaver, and the good thing is they work for uh, moles. So the challenge with this project was we first we set up the beaver fence, and we had it's an old hay field, so a whole pasture. So we had challenges with the bulls. The bulls were eating our trees. We protect for one thing, and then something else comes up. So uh, we had to come in and put some more protectors for again get them established. Once they're big enough, we're hoping that the bulls or we'll leave them alone. Uh, some properties we're working with uh, livestock, so um, cows and sheep and goats. So uh, we, you know, page wire fence works. So, um, so that's again back in com communication. The landowners has to tell us clearly what you know, because we've had field where we we start a project and then we didn't realize, but the, the year or two later, the landowner decided to bring some animals or livestock in there. So our project wasn't prepared for it. So it's good to have a clear agreement in the beginning that there, there will be no livestock or if there are gonna be livestock, we know about it and we prepare for it. So that's, that's doable. So we've done quite a few fencing uh, projects or sometimes you can just use electric fence that will work as well. Uh, again, back to the landowners, they want to protect their banks. So the, the main strategies they are aware of, they know about or often that's done is the rip wrap. So bringing large rocks, large boulders to hold the bank. This one is uh, on, the, on the back road, so it's a, it's, a, it's a road that sort of follows the river, so um, highway doesn't, you know, um, think about it too long, they go and put the rocks when if the road's gonna fail, then they, they protect their road. So they, the rocks is the first option, or the, the main option for them. Uh, they left a few large trees, so that was good. They didn't cut the cedar and the birch that you see there. But <clears throat> the challenge of having too many rip wrap, too many, uh, rocks along the river as you start to becoming uh, a, a whole process of channelization of the river system and often putting rip rock or rocks along your bank or protecting your property you're pushing the problem downstream so the force of the water will bounce back to the property downstream so you're protecting yourself and your neighbor is going to get the impact of the erosion so then what he's going to do he's going to put more rip rock and then you're going down downstream that way just rip wrapping you know creating a whole channel with the river or canal almost so we don't like to do that, so we try to find other alternatives. I'll show in a minute. And then, good old days, they'd use tires and whatever. Our uh, jumps, I've seen our old uh, washing machine thrown on the side of the riverbank, so that, that works, but we're not, uh, yeah, we don't like those. We don't promote those, and it's always the question what do we do once it's in the ground? Do we go and you know, remove all of that? We, you know, there's a few projects we'd like to remove some of that, but you know, it will create a lot. A lot of disturbance if we have to remove it and, until everything else gets established. So, and that's another challenge. Uh, what does nature do? So here, nature would uh, put some trees. Well, uh, the beaver again a good, com a good important component, healthy component of a healthy river system. So they will drop trees, or tree will fall on their own, 
and as the tree falls, it gets anchored down and it will hold the bank so that trees and shrubs will be able to grow again. So, uh, yeah, but we, you know, in some sections of the river, we've lo lost a lot of those larger trees, so there's hardly any old growth trees anymore or any large cottonwood or, or cedars on the river. So those three were very important. And you see the pile of branches at the river, uh, beaver lodge along the river bank there, their supply for the winter. There, there's a good example, a project we did again, North of Winlaw here. Uh, this river bank, this landowner was losing a lot of bank every every year, every few years. So very sandy, uh, silty sand, and of course sand in many places. So the bank was just falling in. You have grass, but grass doesn't have very deep root system in these uh, in these instances. So the grass will hold it for a while, but then it drops into the river as a big clump. So we came into that project, and you know, and there was good good water flow, deep deep river there. So there was great potential for uh, Fish habitat uh, restoration there, so so we brought in a, uh, a a consultant and we were able to design this project using larger structures. So we've got a log in the water in the river. Most of these logs are obviously held down by a rock. So the good thing with this project and these kind of design, there's no steel, there's no pin, there's no cable, nothing. It's just logs and rocks. And on top of that, we plant trees and shrubs so the hawthorn was chosen because they were quite abundant you know in, on that property so we, re, we transplanted some very large hawthorn and again putting them down into the river or on the side of the river so they created a habitat for the smaller fish and, and, and they grow and hawthorn is an amazing species it's a, also a habitat for a diversity of critters as well so and then soon enough, we have photos where the, the, the trout were hanging out in, in that water, and that deep water under the logs and the trees there. And again, on the top, we plant a, a diversity of uh, willow cottonwood and all the riparian species. So that project worked very well. Uh, a similar project there, just south of Winlaw, and that curve, the water wanted, uh, the river wanted to jump the, the bank there, was eroding the bank first and wanted to jump, jump the bank to create channels. So natural channels is a natural process of river to create channel and possible and all of that but because we have uh, properties and farms and houses and buildings and all of that landowners don't want to have the let the river do their own thing so we you know we had a consultant wanting to put a big rip raft so we didn't want to go for a large wall of rock on that property so we look at a different alternative so we brought uh, a design that integrated logs in some or some large rocks so you you have this whole network of logs that was um, laid on on the river protected and held down by rocks and then covered with sod and trees and shrubs so that one also creating habitat and protecting the bank so that worked very well for the landowners where they were very pleased and uh, the different photos at time, different time of year so it green up very quickly and that's the, the idea of these projects it's once you're done it doesn't look like you've done anything it looks like it's nature and doing its own natural things but uh, the bank uh, the river bank is protected and there's habitat for fish and there's habitat for wildlife as well with trees and shrubs so that's high water here that's a lot of water flowing there and then on that same property i was i've been that was I, that project started in 2013 so i start observing and they had this big field right there he, he, on, the, on the background it's spokane river so that turns you got the little white protector that little trees of right here and protect uh, protect, protected trees on the riparian zone. And then you had this field that flood every year, and I thought this is perfect candidate for a wetland restoration project. If you had a lot of water when the river flooded and then it was all gone. So again, we had a long conversation with landowners, and then we looked into a whole study the site, looked into permitting and all of that, and apply for funding, and we're able to uh, winter 20, 13, uh, 2016, sorry, uh, they were to bring a machine to do the excavate, basically restoration, I mean, we excavate the soil that what, that was a wetland or that was still a wetland, but it filled up with time. So uh, we had a you know, two, two or three feet of top soil, black, beautiful muck, you know, so we removed some of that and we're able to dig underneath the sand and the silt and the rock, the gravel to lower this, the um, elevation there to create these uh, shallow wetlands. So we did the five or six shallow wetlands on that property. There's the project in the spring. So spring came, uh, and, and as the water started to come up, uh, we brought the experts. So we had students from uh, Winlaw Elementary School come out and plant some uh, tree shrubs, and we plant also some sedges and rushes. They were pretty excited to walk around, plant the 
got all these uh, trees and, and uh, edges, so that was fun. And it greened up pretty quickly. And then again, high water around the end of May, early June, so that wetland filled up with water. And I was go visit every few days, every week, and it's whole diversity. We put up a lot of bird boxes, bird bat houses. We have a osprey perch there in the background. And it was incredible how, how the whole diversity of the uh, wildlife that would be uh, benefiting from this land. I will just show later on a few photos of who lives in there. So that's the second or the third wetland we dug there. There's six of them. Um, again, using logs for uh, basking logs, all of that. Oops, sorry. And then we, we've been monitoring all those sites. Here's Aria and Darcy, Darcy Kwame from Nelson, who's, who's doing all the monitoring in the sand, in these wetlands. So we're doing both a, a, a cabin, sort of a benthic and a monitoring. Uh, we're monitoring also for mosquitoes, a big issue in the Silicon Valley. So in the first year after restoration, we did uh, three random samples for each wetland, actually seven different area. <clears throat> and we found zero, zero uh, mosquito larva the first year. The second year was uh, 2018, last summer. Uh, again, prime mosquito time in July, I think we found one or two larvae in all total in all of the wetlands. So there was very, there's hardly any. So we created a lot of habit, habitat for the predators. So we're pretty happy to be able to document that and keep an eye on that. So sort of the map of the wetland, there's a five wetland that you see. The largest one on the right is ephemeral. It comes up with the, where the river comes up and then it, as the river goes down, uh, the water table comes down. So, but the one on the left, the three in a row there, they're all holding water year round, even in the winter under the ice. Uh, also that uh, we were able to create a turtle nesting area. There, ha there, there is one tur turtle that has been hanging out there. So we're still hoping she or he will find a partner and, 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 and lay some eggs in the, in the nesting area there. And this property is great because it's along the Spokane Rail Trail. So if you come down the Spokane Valley, just south of Winlaw, about two kilometers south of Winlaw, you can walk along the trail and you can observe from the rail trail this beautiful wetland. So now we're working on a new project north of Winlaw. <clears throat> the project was at first to do four wetland. It's a big pasture that floods. We've done a riparian on the left side, that's a little Spokane River. So we've done a riparian planting already. And then we started the project. Instead of four, we're doing three. Like the two, wetland number three and four have merged to a larger one. So this is a wetland number three and four. So that was done uh, last month in January. So we're able to excavate about a half an hectare of land there. So uh, creating habitat again for you know, quite diverse species, amphibians and all of that. So we'll be putting bird boxes and bat houses in the spring and planting the trees and shrubs. So the advantage of working in the winter is you somewhat have less disturbance, less chance of sinking in, all of that. Uh, the disadvantage is there's a, uh, well, it's cold. You can't plant the trees in the, in the winter, so you have to wait till spring. So and then the, another challenge is all the deadlines with funders. So March 31st being one of our wetlands. <clears throat> Here are the different critters that like to hang out in our wetlands. There's the tadpoles from the Copenhagen uh, wetland project. There's the swallows. Uh, we put up about 30 boxes. The first spring, we had about 10 boxes that had uh, 10 uh, nesting pairs of tree swallows and chickadees as well. Uh, Columbia has spotted frogs, birds, uh, common white tail, uh, dragonflies. It's a lot of dragonflies. Again, great predators. They eat at both at the larvae stage and adult stage. They'll eat a lot of mosquito, mosquito larvae. Nesting. Oh yeah, so we're planting trees and we're putting bird up boxes, but then we realize sometimes the birds will nest in the trees and those willows. So that's a little nest we found in one of our projects on the, on the willow patch there. That's so great. So rewarding to see wildlife moving in. And frogs. The mallard loved our first wetland. Hanging out there for a while. And then also we'd like to bring in the, the arts. So arts and restoration, I think, is a good place to work together. So a friend of ours is doing some beautiful art pieces. So that's the great blue heron that you um, welded and created, and, you know, and we put it up on the on that in that wetland just along the rail trail again. So you can go for a walk. The sign is there, so you can see it. So what else? I'd like to thank all the funders throughout these years. We've had a lot of support from a diverse, a wide diversity of funders for many of our projects. Uh, looking at my notes now, just to see what else I haven't mentioned. Uh, so back to the goals of the Silicon River Screen Keepers. We'd like to, to uh, 
um, create or restore fully functioning biodiverse riparian ecosystem that includes healthy wetland. So that's our long-term vision. So we have some uh, larger projects at a, at a proposal stage. We're also waiting to hear back from funders. So you can go look up on the Silicon River Screenkeepers website. There's a nice short video of the Crooked Horn Wetland Restoration Project, a three minute video you can download and watch. And there's a lot of uh, information, reports and photos on different page of the website. So take a look. And if you want to get a hold of me, I'm at kidneypermaculture.ca, my home. And I would be happy to take any question that the participant may have. Great, thank you, Gregoire. I have a question for you. How do you deal with reed canary grass? Yeah, that's a good one. That's a good, challenging one for sure. The grass is uh, through, I guess, a combination of uh, cutting, I guess, mulching, uh, planting trees and shrubs. Some places I'm planting very dense. I'm hoping that density of the trees and shrub will eventually outcompete that. Uh, planting taller trees has been uh, a good strategy as well because as I mentioned earlier the shorter trees would get overwhelmed with the grass and sometimes uh, when the grass is tall and if we don't get a chance uh, to go and cut it uh, or when we go cut it well, when we have the protectors that helps also find the trees because I've had a few uh, incidents where I've ending up cutting the trees while I'm trying to cut the grass. So the grass gets very tangled with the trees. It's, it's a bit of a challenge for sure. So it's one of our biggest one there. Uh, with wetland, uh, the, the strategies, I guess, is to uh, create a diversity of elevations so that uh, canary grass likes to grow where there's flooding in May, June, and then when it comes to its power, it's a bit of drought, but you know, uh, it likes that whole zone where it fluctuates between flood and dry. So. Yeah, it's, uh, again, if we can get there before the grass takes over, it's a better strategy. Uh, otherwise, we've been sort of cutting and mulching and, you know, and uh, yeah, pulling and, this and uh, replacing it. It's, it's a big one, it's a big deal. Great, thanks, Gregor. How frequently do you have to cut back the reed canary grass? If we can do it once or twice, but in reality, we often just do it once just because, again, time and, and money. I guess we had, when the project started, there was a lot of expectation landowners would be doing their own maintenance. So there was no funding allocated at all to a maintenance. So we've had a lot of uh, losses that way. That some of the early projects didn't do as well for many different reasons. Landowners often either don't have time, don't have the physical uh, ability or resources or it's not a priority or a wide diversity reason they may or may not show up on the on the on the bank to take care of it. So uh, stream keepers, uh, we, we you know sometimes we do have volunteer, but it's all back to coordinating and access. So these projects are spread out from Slocan or the village of Slocan all the way down to the Crescent South Slocan or Crescent Valley Junction there. So it's a, what is it 30 to 50 kilometers of uh, of river. So it's a wide area. So. If we're able to show up there once a year, then that's good. Uh, but uh, again, with the fluctuation of water, we have this flooding that happens in uh, late May, early June, and then we have a drought, and we've been having these summer droughts that goes from September to, uh, sorry, from uh, July maybe to September, October. So then the problem is there's no water. So sometimes the grass may be holding moisture. Do we leave it? Do we cut it, put it on the ground? Uh, so we've had to uh, kind of assess some of that. And, uh, some of our project, we actually had to bring in some. Uh, uh, watering, you know, a pump and water from, you know, with sprinklers or whatever to, to ensure the tree would survive because some of the sites are very poor, like you, you got two or three feet deep sand or, or deeper or sand or gravel, so there's no, no uh, organic matter, there's no, nothing to hold the moisture, so that part of that mulching has helped a lot. And some of the new project, when we find too much sand, we are building, bringing some uh, soil in, uh, so amendment some, you know, compost or, you know, or anything to hold the moisture, you know, into the soil so that our trees get a chance. Because once they're established, they'll push their roots down to, to the water table and they'll be okay. But if these first two years, three years, same with the grass, if you can clear them out for the third, first two or three years, sometimes a bit more, uh, then they get a chance, then they get above the grass and then they're fine, they don't know. Great, thank you. Um, the next question is, could you talk more about advantages and disadvantages of digging with big equipment in winter? Uh, I, I guess again, it's all site specific. You get to know, you have to know your site, you have to know your machine, and then, uh, and again, good communication. The machine operator is very important. Uh, 
if the site is too wet. We've had the, the last project, we had half of the site. And it's so interesting because, you, you know, you may do the little test pit holes before, but you're only going so far, you're two, three feet deep, you know. Uh, the first thing once you bring the machine is to dig a, a bigger test pit, so go down to three to six feet if you can, to really see what's going on. So we had half the site that were that wetland project where it's, uh, we had water on the surface basically. It came out dry in um, October, September, October was dry. And then when we had the rain in the late October, November, it, the water came up and it was holding there. So after digging, we realized it was under the about a two, three feet of top soil. Organic matter, we had a two or three feet of uh, clay, clay soil. So that clay was holding the water on the surface. So there was a few risk of sinking the machine in there. So we always have to have logs uh, nearby so you can put the logs under the machine or usually the strategy is not to go in and if the soil is frozen, but then again, uh, we had a few cold days, but it was starting to warm up. So we had some warm days in January. Uh, so uh, yeah, a few times we had to bring in the logs so the machine would put logs under, uh, under the excavator to prevent sinking, so create a, a pad. So, uh, so those are the big ones for sure. Um, advantage is you, you, there's less critters are gone, so there's less risk of, you know, uh, disturbing wildlife, I guess. It's the right thing going on at that time of the year. Uh, the other one was snow. We had to spend, I don't know what, three, four, five hours pushing snow. So we had about a foot of snow or so. So snow requires, you know, and, uh, removal. I guess we had to remove it because with the machine, otherwise it would get sticky with the soil. We had to separate the soil. So we find it quicker to have a dozer pushing the snow for a few hours. So that's a negative. So the, the ideal, uh, you know, uh, condition would be cold, very cold, uh, not too cold because you, you're outside just kind of watching the project or, uh, or managing the project, but you know, like in minus 10 or so, 15, you know, and then uh, no snow or little snow. Because if it's mild and you get lots of snow, then the snow is a lot of work. And if it's warmer, then it's, you know, then it's things. So colder is good. Uh, but again, you have to wait till spring to plant. So those are the main challenge and the uh, good aspect of it. Great, thanks, Gregoire. The next question is, um, how do we get highways on board for taking a more proactive approach rather than reactive? We have the same issue dealing with them in the boundary on the Canadian Granby River. Uh, conversation, education, uh, relation, uh, building relationship, I think, finding your allies. And sometimes in these different government uh, agencies, you have allies or people there that are very supportive of your work. Some people may not as be, may not be as supportive. Uh, uh, another thing we found that uh, are you know, working in, along the Spokane River for 15 years is creating these, uh, these sites, uh, these uh, places, uh, these examples that we've done. That has worked for us with the landowners at least there. And owners see the neighbors, oh, that's working out for the neighbors, so okay, let's do the same. So sort of mimicking, so learning from, from uh, successes, so that's a good strategy. Uh, yeah, documenting, sharing, you know, what, what's working uh, other side, outside of the region, if you don't have an example locally, uh, sharing other examples from the uh, other region. Uh, yeah, long conversation, just kind of, you know, trying to find a middle ground also, sometimes people do, Two different um, people or agencies or clients have different different goals. So uh, our goal was to create, I guess mentioned earlier, fully functioning biodiverse riparian ecosystem. Highway may not may or may not care for that. You know, they want a road. They want to maintain their road. So they're gonna, you know, put the riprap. So the riprap may may be okay, but maybe they can put trees. And we've seen a vegetated riprap, so that works. So there's a lot of documentation uh, documentation online about vegetated riprap, so you can put trees and shrubs. But we also had to work with a client that was uh, managing a dike and with dike they didn't want to see any tree. They were going to remove every tree. So we had to basically back away from there and then create a zone. So you leave them their zone where they're going to, they have a high priority and then there's a zone above if you can, you know, and then that's where you put the trees and your, your, your wildlife uh, habitat and corridor. So sometimes it works, sometimes you have to let go or sometimes you can do trade off too. So um, yeah, you can create an area further down. Because if they do disturbance, then the highway has to do compensation as well. So they have to compensate somewhere else. So if they disturb an habitat, they have to recreate, restore another habitat. So there might be another way to work with them in, in, that, in that way. So. Great, thank you, Gregoire. Um, the next question is, did you hire engineers to design the wetlands? And how did you come up with the design plans for wetlands? 
Um, short answer is no, although we did have, we did consult with uh, Tom Big Hauser, which has been the, one of our mentor, you know, in the West Vietnamese and from BC that has done thousands of wetland restoration. So he was able to see and visit the site first before we started. So, and then I've been able to visit a lot of the sites and projects that he's worked on. He's also an engineer today, but he's a wetland restoration specialist, uh, long time experience, 20, 30 years now, I think. So, um, so it's a combination, I guess, clarifying the goals. What were the goals? We were you know, wanting to create habitat for diverse sea species, but sometimes you can't do it all. So the amphibians were pretty high on our list. So having water, and I was very happy, in, actually in both sides, that we'll have a combination of uh, uh, year, some wetlands will be year round and other wetlands will be ephemeral. So ephemeral wet, wetlands also serve many functions it's okay that there's water and it's okay that there's a time of the year there's no water. So different species are able to, to live there. Uh, the sites are very small. So I've been able to visit some very large sites when they, they, you, with a larger site, you're able to do many different um, that strategies, I guess. So I found that was my biggest challenge. I was trying to do, you know, wanting to do too many things on the small area. So I'm still able to put, you know, uh, basking logs and the turtle nesting area, bird, bird boxes, all of that, that's all been part of it. But the other part is uh, studying and learning about hydrology. And, and it, you know, and again, as you, and being able to adapt. So, and part of my strategy is also to go uh, small, uh, small is beautiful and slow is the same. So for the permaculture principle, I, I, I always use throughout my projects so that Working with a small project, just uh, making it work and adapting, so the adaptive management is called. So see what works, how can you modify, how can you, you know, because on that wetland, again, the water is coming from two directions. On the first wetland, uh, I mentioned the crooked horn farm, uh, we have water coming from seepage from the mountain, and we have water coming from flooding from the river. So these two uh, sources of water, hydrology, are, are behaving very differently, uh, different, uh, well, similar seasons, but at the same time, they behave differently. So trying to, again, being clear. And for that project, and often many of wetland restoration, it's going back into time, that property had been uh, uh, ditched for draining, and it had been filled, you know, for trying to farm, but it was still marginal, it was still not feasible for the farmer, so they hadn't been uh, farming that, that area we worked with. So by the excavation, we were able to excavate, create a wetland, a little shallow air wetland area, and then the wetland already on two or three feet deep in the, you know, in the most cases, and that creates enough habitat for the, the amphibian. And then with that spill, that soil that was uh, excavated, we were able to build it up and create um, higher ground for the, the farmers. So eventually, they were able to get in earlier in the spring and potentially grow some crop or at least some green manure crop for, for them. So it's a, uh, it's often the potential is always for win-win. So everybody can can win. So it's not a farmer has got to let go, of, you know, uh, whatever an acre or half an acre or an acre from the lose the part of that. We also creating uh, attracting a lot of beneficial uh, predators, I guess, for their pest problems. So allies, I like to call them. So they will be eating a lot of the bugs that eat their crops. So they really gain from that. But yeah, so the big one is hydrology and soil. The soil. Uh, layers so finding out what kind of soil there and the first obviously is to do the test to see if you can have a wetland so there are some rumors that uh, sometimes wetlands are placed in the wrong place or places that cannot hold, or didn't have a wetland before or cannot hold the wetland so uh, we try to work with uh, you know sites that have that were our wetland or were wetland and if the site is already fully functioning then we don't like to disturb so uh, part of that wetland again had a, uh, like a cattail slash uh, fern, I mean lady fern uh, patch there that we just left alone. That area was doing fine. There's a whole bunch of cattails, so we left that alone. Uh, so and, and there's another place, another landowner that wanted me to work on a on a creating more uh, restoring a wetland, but it's already a functioning forest there. It's a riparian forest. It's called when there's some other evergreens and all that. And, I personally don't necessarily want to go there if it's already functioning. There's a whole diversity. There's things are okay there. There's yeah, there's water coming up and down. But uh, so we want to work with more like in a site that have highly disturbed, and then again just look at the go through a different step observation. It's a bit like per permaculture. It's a first step is observation. The second step is information gathering. 
and after that, the third step is the problem solving. So what do we want to achieve? Hope that answers that question. Yeah, and that's great, Gregoire. Um, we've got about seven questions uh, left and about five minutes. So I'll just um, quickly run through one of them here. I think you've um, answered it for the most part, but do you have any references or principles you follow when developing a restoration plan? Maybe just give a, a brief overview of that. References, well, again, a lot of the work from uh, Tom Baby Hausler. I cannot mention him enough. There's some wetland restoration uh, handbook that he's published and uh, some a lot of things online. Uh, process, again, is still kind of walking the site. And if you can visit the site at different time of the year, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a bonus because of, you know, observing that hydrology when the water comes up, when does the water come down? Uh, if there's no water on the surface, you know, where's the water going to come from? So you need to know, you know, again, to study our maps. So we did a lot of uh, mapping and assessment to a pro pro project we call the so SOCAN Wetland Assessment and Monitoring Project, so SWAMP, uh, the acronym, which is fun. Um, so we documented a lot of wetland and see the, the state of the wetland. If there's a lot of invasive species, uh, so-called weeds and canary grass, then we can go and remove that. But you know, and then digging holes, looking at the layers of soil. So that's all part of the process. Uh, observing what the, you know, what the, where's the water come from, where's the water going. If there's ditching, if there's some part of the, not so much in this area, but often in many parts of North America and around the world, there's on the ground uh, piles, uh, drainage tiles. So that are were put in a long time ago or more recently. So then you have to address that. You have to find out where they are. Um, so those are some of the strategies. And again, the fill, you know, if it's already been filled, uh, then that's a good sign that, you know, that's a sign that's got good potential. And a lot of, again, and the, uh, unfortunately, there's the whole uh, edge between the farming and a lot of the farms were wetlands. So that's, uh, we have to find a common place there where we can still farm or have better farm farming uh, condition and still create some habitat for wildlife and wetlands. Great. Um, the next question is, do you monitor in-stream project after completion, i.e. wood debris structure after a couple freshet seasons? Uh, yes, some of them are monitored by our funders for their um, fish habitat restoration. Uh, some of the riparian, yeah, they were monitored by them and us, I guess, and then we go back to the site and again assess what What's surviving? If we have a lot of dieback in trees and shrub, then we replant the the, the, the fish structures. That have been also they were reassessed by an engineer to see if things were moving and things were still in the ground. Again, the the three project we did with fish habitat structure had no no steel, no pin, no cable. So if worst case one gets loose and start floating down the river, that's all it is. It's just a log floating down the river. So the the risks are pretty minimal. Well, we haven't had that happen, so we had actually well, the other way around. Some some loggers trying to you know, uh, deposit on the banks of there where we our projects are. So yeah, we keep an eye on things for sure. We monitor it, and then we monitor in different ways. And then mon the wetlands have been monitored a bit more intensively for many for many reasons. So uh, just to document again, to you know, it's a kind of a new-ish uh, movement, I guess, in the Spokane Valley and around the Kootenays or BC. So the whole wetland reparation is uh, evolving quickly. So it's great to have. To know what we're up to, what's going on, what's working, what's not, so we support that for sure. Next question. Great, thanks, Gregor. Have you completed any projects in partnership with First Nations? Um, let's see, not recently for, uh, yeah, for a different reason. I guess short answer is no. Okay, the next question is Do you buy your stock, and if so, from where? The plant material, yeah, good question. Thank you. Uh, actually, I started a small nursery, so I'm able to propagate a lot of native plants in my own backyard. So I have a diversity of, of, uh, of cottonwood rows and the red oak, dogwood, and all, all the species that are used, or most of the species that are used along the riverbank and some of our wetlands come from my own small nursery in my own backyard. So I'm fortunate to do that. But I've also been supporting the other two main nursery around the province, around the, around the province, around the region. So, yeah, both. Thank you. How wide a riparian buffer do you recommend to landowners for bank protection projects? I would say this is a bit site specific as much as possible, as much as they're able to, it, sometimes it's a letting go more than, uh, you know, uh, 
landowners uh, want to use their land. Some landowners want to, again, they, we all have a different vision of the river. We like fully functioning biodiverse riparian. They sometimes want a beach or they want to see the river, so they want to clear the trees, so we discourage that. We can prune the branches, we suggest. Yeah, you can create some holes, some little windows on the river where you can prune branches and all that. So the, the more the better, but you know, some of our projects were at least uh, 10 meters, 30 feet. Uh, you know, if you could do you know, 30 meters, that'd be great, but most landowners won't do that. Uh, depending what their what their use of the land, how much land they have, for if their property is very small, you know, may may want to use some of it. But we we work with the landowners, so we you know pathways to the river is fine with us. We leave them pathways. There's you know some some will want a pathway, some will want a little area to sit down, maybe in the, on the grass, you know, a little mold area. They they sit down, have picnic or swim, jump in the river, all of that. It's, it's all it's good with us. As long you know, you can have it all basically. You can have your riparian, healthy riparian, and you can have a path to it, and you can have a place to sit down and enjoy. But we don't, you know, want to clear, clear cut along the bank. So we, as much as possible, we try to bring as much vegetation as possible. So, uh, yeah, thanks. Great, thanks, Gregoire. We just have a couple questions left. Um, I thought we could take, answer these, and then I'll do a closing. So we'll be about five minutes over the allotted time. Um, what other species, shrubs, and trees do you use for both riparian and wetland sites? We're only working with native species for many reasons. We want to, you know, uh, support that. And, we, and again, the native species has the most chance to survive. So a wider diversity as much as we can. Uh, on the bank, if the site is open and clear, usually we, we work with the pioneer species. So you've got your willows and con, conwoods and uh, alders, red oak, the dogwood, red oak, the dogwood will tolerate more uh, shade. So we can work with that. And then some sites, if there's already a bit of shade, then we'd like to introduce, if it's high enough, if it floods, they won't survive as well, but some evergreen, it's nice to have some cedars, because a lot of those red cedars were there before, but they all been removed. So uh, whenever I have a chance, I'll put in a few cedars in there, and you know, sometimes it's fir, dark fir, dark fir, or spruce, they all seem to you know, do well along the bank of the river. Uh, and then you can get in more diversity if you want, especially with wetland, you know, you can explore the Saskatoon, the red, uh, the uh, cherries, all the, the plants that produce berries, you may attract a lot of birds. Hawthorn is an amazing plant. I'd love to work more with hawthorn. It's a great, beautiful wildlife plant, but it has a, not as fun to work along around, you know, if you're kind of you know, working one, between a hawthorn and a, and a, and a, and a, and a plant one, one year. So it's a, not as pleasant, but it's a great one for bird habitat and all of that. So, you know. Most species that will survive that kind of habitat. So moisture loving species, I guess. Mm, yes, thanks. Great, thank you. The last question is, how did you determine which target species to focus on for wetlands? You mentioned amphibians. Right. Um, again, that's sort of again through observation of the sites. What do we have? Conversation with landowners, conversation within the stream keepers and our community here. You know, we have some parts of the Spokane that has uh, sometimes some a few insects that people like to not like, I guess. So uh, that has been a bit of a focus for us. There's a rumor that wetland attract more of these, you know, uh, insects people don't like. Uh, but we found the opposite, the rest of our wetland are attracting more the predators. So through all the diversity of amphibians and then putting up bird boxes, bathhouses and all that and attracting also the uh, dragonflies and all, all of that. So that attract uh, a lot of predators of these so-called insects that bite people in the summer and all that. So we're trying to, that's been a big target, a big focus for us to have a, a wide diversity of predators. So, uh, you know, and, and the side effect is you, you create a little, you know, you know, you, you, you create habitat and they will come. So you have a habitat, you have water there. So what happens in the drought, I mean, that side will hold water, you know, everything else. We've had a site we I was able to observe a little baby fawn, a little deer that was uh, it was even two, three feet, a meter from me, and I didn't see it in the, in the grass, so he just jumped in front of me. So, uh, you know, other critters, I'm sure the bears will come and visit, maybe moose eventually. Uh, so a lot of critters will come and visit, all the, all the birds, and, you know, and, uh, and uh, ducks and all of that. The uh, uh, migrating birds will come and see, they see a puddle there. Uh, the Canada geese, the landowners, don't, the farmers don't want them in their farms, so we try not to create too much habitat for them. <laughs> it's a big challenge. but. Uh, yeah, so it's, again, through conversation with our landowners, with, you know, maybe neighbors sometime. There was another project I was just watching recently. They had a, uh, 
uh, airport nearby, so they wanted to make sure they would not attack a whole bunch of uh, birds, ducks, and migrating birds near an airport. So not a good strategy. So you got to know your site, your small re ecosystem in a larger region, and see what the what can be done there. And it's great, it's great fun. I think it's great. So there's both both a scientific approach, you know, and there's also a bit of an artistic approach. So it's, you, you create and you know, things, uh, and the site will evolve. So I'm very excited to go back every season, every year to see how it's just. To me, it's just going to multiply and just get better with time. That's why it's part we want to keep documenting it. Great. Great. Thank you very much, Gregoire. Um, we're so glad you're able to join us today for the presentation. And thank you to everyone for joining us. I hope you enjoyed it. Uh, please expect a follow up email tomorrow with a link to an online post webinar survey with just seven questions. We appreciate your feedback as it'll help us plan for future webinars. Our next webinar is on the Rocky Mountain Trench Ecosystem Restoration Program with Mark Trudeau. And that's Thursday, March 7th, the same time, 10 a.m. Pacific Standard Time. And a registration link will be included up in the follow-up email. And we really hope to see you then. Um, thanks again, Gregoire. Thanks, Nicole. And thanks, um, Kristen, as well. Yeah, and thank you. On behalf of the Columbia Basin Watershed Network, thank you to Gregoire and the Slocan River Streamkeepers for your amazing work. And Thank you to the Kootenai Conservation Program for this all lovely opportunity to collaborate. Great, thank you, Adrienne, and thank you, Kristen. I'll be on the river, see you later. All right. Thanks, everyone. <laughs> mm -hmm.